from the mafia or a gang member or a criminal, when he gets shot and he gets killed, they say now he's in a better place because they don't have the deeds. They believe that Jesus died for their sins, alayhi salam, so they can do as they please in this life. But we as Muslims, we believe that we will be held accountable on the day of judgment for our sins and those who obey the law and follow his command that they will be entering the Jannah and those who disobey him subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will be in the hellfire. And it's important that we point out if we're going to be successful and die in the state of Islam, the only way we can do this is to follow the path and the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِن رَسُولٍ إِلَّا لِيُطَاعْ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never sent any messenger except for that he is to be obeyed by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we must ask ourselves now, do we obey our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Do we implement his sunnah in our life alayhi salatu wa sallam? If we were to go to a doctor now and find that we have some illness, some disease, and he were to give us the cure, he said, alhamdulillah, we found the illness in the beginning stages. All you have to do now is take medicine and you will be cured. And you tell him, okay, Tiki, I will do it. Good. I'll do it. And then uh, you go home and you don't take the medicine. Will you benefit from what he told you? You're not going to benefit. Also, when we claim to be Muslims, we claim to be following the Prophet ﷺ, we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, and we don't follow him, we will not benefit from what we're saying. Also now, to go to a job, and our boss were to tell us what we need to do to be successful in the workplace, how to do our job properly, and then we go every morning and we just sit there and do nothing. Will we be successful in our workplace? Also, we will not be successful. So when we claim to love the Prophet ﷺ, we claim to love Allah, how do we know this is true in our actions? Some of us now, the first thing we do when we get up in the morning, do we get up and pray Fajr on time? Or do we pray it after the, the sun so we can get a little extra sleep? And then a lot of us, when we get up, the first thing we do is stand in front of the mirror and we shave our beards so we can look like so-and-so and not like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this shows us the actions in your life and how you act if you really love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you cannot die in the state of Islam unless you're on the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kullu ummati yadkhuluna la jannah illa man aba. That all of my ummah will enter the paradise except for those who refuse. And pay attention to this hadith. And the Sahaba said, وَمَنْ يَأْبَىٰ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ They were surprised. And this is the same thing I say to my students at the beginning of each year when they ask about the test. They say, oh, Ustad, how's the test? How's the test going to be? I say, all of you will pass on my exam except for he who refuses to pass. And they say, who refuses to pass? Well, somebody refused to pass. Now the Prophet وسلم, is telling the Sahaba that all of his ummah will enter paradise except for he who refuses. And he said, Man ya Rasulullah, who will refuse? That's something, it seems very like a very strange statement. He said, Man ata'ani dakhal al jannah, wa man asani faqad aba. That whoever obeys me, he will enter the jannah, and whoever disobeys me, then he is from the one who has refused. So now we must ask ourselves, are we from those who obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Are we from those who follow his sunnah? And if you are, inshallah, bi'idnillah, you will be going to the jannah. And if you are not, then you are from the people who have refused the jannah. May Allah protect us all from that. Also, pay attention to this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ أَرَادَ الْآخِرَ وَسَعَلَهَا سَعْيَهَا وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٌ That whoever has desire for the hereafter. And all of us claim that we have a desire to be in Al-Jannah and to be far away from the hellfire. But what's important as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, was sa'alaha sa'yaha, that you strive for it with the necessary effort. So it's not enough to just be mu'min, to be a believer. If you're not striving and putting forth the effort, then you will not benefit from this desire that you claim you have. فَأُولَٰئِكَ كَانَ سَعْيُهُمْ مَشْكُورًا And those will be the ones who their striving will be appreciated or be accepted and will get the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we talk about death, ayyuhal ikhwa, 
And the reality of death is Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, Rahimahullah, what he used to say. He used to say, إِذَا مَا ذَكَرْتِ الْمَوْتِ سَعَى مَا تَقَلْبِي If I do not remember death any every hour, then my heart will die. How many times have we remembered death and thought about death and thought about preparing for death? How many of us has written his wasiya? Ask yourself now. Can I get a raise of hands if somebody has written his will? Be honest, don't be ashamed. Who has written their will? They're ready to die. Nobody in the audience. You wrote yours, alhamdulillah. I want to write mine. I keep saying I'm going to do it, but I haven't done it. I said, I haven't done it yet. And this is from the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he told us that we should not put our heads down at night until we have written our wasiyah. We are prepared for death. But unfortunately, most of us, we're not ready. Because we think we're going to be here forever, or we hope anyways. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to encourage, or the beginning of Islam, he forbid the Muslims from visiting graves. Why? Because he was afraid what could happen from shirk. Because these are people who used to be mushrikeen. They used to be polytheists and they used to worship idols. So he knew what happened to the people of Nuh and the ones who came after him who, when they committed shirk. So he was afraid that this could happen to his ummah. So he forbid them in the beginning of Islam to visiting graves. But then after that, he saw that there was a greater benefit in visiting the graves. So he said, كُنْتَ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُوهَا فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرْ بِالْآخِرَةِ He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that I used to forbid you from visiting the graves. He said, so visit the graves because verily it reminds you of the hereafter. When you visit the graves, as it was done in the sunnah of the Prophet So he said, كُنْتَ نَهَيْتُكُمْ عَنْ زِيَارَةِ الْقُبُورِ فَزُورُوهَا فَإِنَّهَا تُذَكِّرْ بِالْآخِرَةِ When you look into the grave, it reminds you that one day you will be in a bunch of white sheets and they will be lowering you into your grave. And this reminds you to prepare and to get ready for that great day. Also, from the things that we benefit from these disasters and hardships that we face in everyday life is a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are here in this dunya to do as many good deeds as possible to get prepared for the hereafter. And this is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Kun fid dunya ka'annaka gharib aw abiru sabil. To be in this dunya as if you are somebody, as a stranger or somebody who is just passing through. And if you look at how you live when you, go, when you travel to another country, you, how much do you take of your clothes? When you travel, do you take your refrigerator and your clothes and your washing machine, you put it on the car, you take all the things, you pull your house behind you. No, you just take a few things. And this is how the Muslims should be in the dunya. It doesn't mean you can't have things from the dunya, but you should focus on that what you need. And that what will help you get to the akhirah. And that's important that we point out that the zuhud, when we talk about zuhud in the dunya, as it was mentioned by Ibn Taymiyyah, that the proper zuhud is that which leaving does not help us in reaching the akhirah. Anything from the dunya that will help us in reaching the akhirah, leaving it is not from zuhud. But we should focus on doing as many good deeds as we can. Just as somebody who's passing through, he's doing a job in a certain city, and then he's leaving. And this is how the Muslims should be in this dunya. Uh, we know that eventually we're going to die and move on to the hereafter, so we want to prepare for that day. And that's why Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma, he would narrate this hadith, وَإِذَا أَمْسَيْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الصَّبَاحِ وَإِذَا أَصْبَحْتَ فَلَا تَنْتَظِرِ الْمَسَاءِ That if you were to wake up in the morning, do not wait for the evening. If you were to reach the evening, then do not wait for the morning. Because you never know when your time will be coming. A very touching story that happened a few months back to one of our mashaykh in Saudi Arabia. And this reminds you about writing the wasiyah, about writing your will before you die. One of the mashaykh, he was traveling, his name is Sheikh Abdulaziz al-Wahibi rahimahullah. He was traveling from Riyadh to the Eastern province to give a lecture. And before he left, his wife, his first wife, and his daughters, he had eight daughters, mashallah, they said, we want to go with you as like a vacation. After you do your lecture, then we'll, and we'll hang out there for some time 
and this will be our vacation for the summer. So the sheikh said, okay, he got in his car and he started to drive. He's driving down the highway. For some reason, his daughter, who was a very pious Muslim, and one of the sisters who had memorized the Quran and had memorized the Qira'at, different recitations, and she was working and in, in spreading Islam and spreading the Quran and helping other Muslim women memorize the Quran, she started to write her wasiyah as she was in the car. As they were going, somebody and a truck in front of him, it seems he didn't have his lights working, so the sheikh, he collided into the back of this big truck. He immediately died. His first wife died. The second wife was at home, she didn't go with him. And four of his daughters, I believe, out of the eight, also died. And he, most of them instantly, and some died in the hospital. So this, a family is going out. Alhamdulillah, they're going for khair. They're going for da'wah. And they're going on vacation to change the everyday life. So they're going out for something that's good and praiseworthy. And they're going to have fun. And just like that, uh, six of them or five of them immediately die. So you never know when the death is going to come. And that's why Ibn Umar radiallahu an, he would say, do not wait for the evening if you wake up in the morning. And do not wait for the morning if you reach the evening because you never know when you're going to go. And it was said by some of the tabi'een, about 30 of them, rahimahumullah, uh, that if they were to be told tomorrow that it was the qiyamah or that they would be dying, they could not do any more actions because they were working so hard and doing ibadah and worship and doing good for Islam. And this is how a Muslim must be at all times, trying to do as many good deeds as he can. And to remind ourselves that how you die, this is how you will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if somebody is doing something that which is haram, some people now, he goes into his bedroom and he watches that which is haram and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the door moves, oh, he, he's scared. Somebody's going to see what he's looking at. But he forgets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him. His weakness and his iman. And just to think, if you were to die on that, if you were to be found, you're watching something that was haram. Somebody is to be found dead, he has committed zina. Recently in Sudan, there were two, they were on the wrong path. And this man, he picked up this young lady, and they decided to go to his garage and do what they were going to do. That's Allah al-Afiyah. So when he pulled into the garage, and he was a very ignorant person, he didn't realize that they could die from the fumes and the carbon monoxide inside the garage with the windows and the AC on in the car. So they were found the next morning naked in his car. May Allah protect us from that. So now these people, this is how they will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. If somebody drinks khamar, and becomes drunk, he will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is drunk. May Allah protect us from this. So we always must remind ourselves of the reality of death and that this dunya is for us to prepare for the hereafter. These disasters and difficulties we see in everyday life, this is a great reminder to us for these things. And also in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he said that if the children of Adam, if they die, they will take three things with them to their grave. Ahlahu wa maluhu wa amalu. His family will follow him to the grave. Also, his money, it's still his until he's buried in his grave. And his deeds. Two will return. The family and the money, they will return. And the only thing you will have with you is on that day in your grave is your deeds. And we will end, inshallah ta'ala, this lecture with this verse. And many verses in the Quran. The people who died, they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send them back to the dunya so they could do good deeds. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, وَيَوْمَ يَعُدُّ الظَّالِمُ عَلَى يَدَيْهِ The day that the person who is a zalim, he has oppressed himself by doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will be biting on his hands out of the fear of that great day. يَقُولُ يَا لَيْتَنِي اتَّخَذْتُ مَعَ رَسُولِ سَبِيلًا He will say, I wish I had taken a path with the Prophet. He will wish that he had followed the path of the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba and the pious of the scholars of Islam and those who implemented Islam who came after them. He wish he had followed this path. يَا وَيْلَتَا لَيْتَنِي لَمْ أَتَّخِذْ فُلَانًا خَلِيلًا He will say, 
and he woe to me. I wish I didn't take so-and-so as a friend. Why? What did this person do to you? He will say, That he distracted me or took me away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after it came to me. That a shaytan is for humans a deserter. He will call us to that which seems to be beautiful and seems to be nice, but then he will desert us at the end. May Allah protect us from all this. So this is a reminder. And one of the things we remind, as the brother said in the beginning when I asked, he said it's ibra, that it's something that we can reflect on. It's a reminder to all of us. When we see these great tragedies, that it reminds us that we must be in the best state. We must be of those, as Allah SWT said, وَلَا تَمُتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمِ Do not die except for in the state of istislam, of being a Muslim who has submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also, we see from the difficulties that have happened to the Muslim ummah today. Because all of us are labeled as terrorists. We're guilty until I'm proven innocent. And the Western laws, you're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But as a Muslim, you are guilty until proven innocent, unfortunately. So now, also, this is a big test for the Muslims today to see what they're going to do with this, their Islam. Allah is testing us. A lot of people now, uh, we've seen people have brought their children back to the Eastern countries and they know nothing about Islam. They, know nothing, they don't know how to read Al-Fatiha because they're scared and embarrassed to be Muslims. They don't want people to know. They're undercover Muslims, only at home. When it comes time to pray at his job place, he doesn't pray. So this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Muslims, we do not agree with extremism. But at the same time, we do not agree with having a watered-down version of Islam where we do that which is haram and displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please the non-Muslims. And I say again that the message we take and we benefit from this lecture is that we must reflect and benefit on disasters or anything. It might seem evil in our lives. There could be a lot of good in it. We just have to reflect and see what that good is and uh, benefit from it and we should be always in the state the best state so we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that he will be pleased with us and at the end Allahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabina Muhammad Jazakallah khaira brother Abdurrahim Makathi for an excellent set of lessons and reminders now we will have the question and answer session insha'Allah and just a reminder, the question and answer session is open both to Muslims and non-Muslims. And we do give preference to non-Muslims. If you do wish to ask a question, just ask one of the volunteers and they will put you to the front of the queue, inshallah. Just a quick reminder as well, some of the etiquettes of the question and answer session. Do make sure that your questions are on the topic at hand. Please keep the questions short and concise and ask one question at a time. Make sure to speak loudly and clearly as it can be a little bit difficult to hear some of the questions up here. And as well, state your name and profession before the questions. So we'll commence now with the question and answer session and we'll have the first question coming from the front mic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. My name is Talat Ansari, I'm from Nagpur. My question on topic related to disaster is related to Christianity concept of Born sin or original sin. And the scenario is the flood of Nuha described in Bible as well as in Quran. And Quran says, if you are not learned, ask the learned. I am taking you as learned of not only Quran but also Bible. I am asking this question in the light of Bible that when the flood of Nuha as described in Bible which saved all good peoples, meaning that all sinners were drowned. No sinner were alive. So, still, if Christians believe that son of Adam is sinner, is it correct? Or, son of Adam, like us, like other Christians, their sin has already been cleared during the flood of Noah. This question is from brother also and all Christians also. Just a quick reminder, please keep the questions on the topic at hand. The topic at hand is reflection upon the world's disasters. I'll leave it to the speaker to, if he wants to address this or not, but they must be on topic, otherwise we'll go to the next question. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we'll go over it quickly. And it, what I know as a former Christian, and the Christians believe that when 
Jesus was placed on the cross and crucified as they believe, that this was for the forgiveness of their sins. And I don't know about the flood of Nuh, but the, what is known is that the Christians believe that uh, Christ being crucified in their belief, that this was for the, for the forgiveness of their sins. But if we look at this rationally and logically, why did God create heaven and hellfire? If everybody's going to go to heaven as long as they believe in the person who does good deeds and bad deeds, all of them are going to heaven, then why is there hellfire? Also, Christians claim to believe in, in the day of judgment. That if nobody's going to be judged, he takes a direct flight right to, to Jannah, to paradise. What is the benefit? So anyways, in Islam teaches us that we are all held accountable for our deeds. And they will all stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment and be judged for our deeds. And we have a scale, which on one side will have the, the good deeds and on the other side, the bad deeds. And whichever one is heavier will be the place where we will go. If some Muslims enter the hellfire, then perhaps they will leave. They have not committed shirk. They will leave, inshallah, the hellfire at a later time after they are, are punished for what they have done in this dunya. And when we have this type of aqidah, this type of belief, this causes us to strive to what? To implement Islam. And now, that's why you don't find the Muslims who fornicate as much as non-Muslims. Because they realize what could happen to them in the hereafter for, for committing this great t crime. You don't find a lot of Muslims, and you find, might find a few, but it's, they're, they're not practicing Islam. But in general, you don't find Muslims who will get, who will get drunk because they know of the, the evil effects of this in this dunya and the evil effects they can have. As the Prophet said, Man minha fit dunya, lam fil Whoever drinks from it in the dunya, he will not drink from it in the hereafter. So all of this, it shows us, and this is the logical thing, that we are held accountable. We're not just sitting here to do what we want to do in this dunya and then have a free ride at the end. We're going to be held accountable. Just as if we were to have a job, we will be held accountable for our performance in our job. Also, we'll be held accountable for our deeds in this dunya. And Allahu A'lam. Thank you. The next question from the Rayamai. Assalamu alaikum. Myself, Liyakat Shah. I am a teacher by profession and I came all together from Busawal. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Zakir Naik and all the Islamic scholars who had arrived here. And it shows or displays a wonderful extravagance bonanza of Islamism. Really, I would like to salute all those dignitaries who had come here. Well, my question is that I would like to ask to the dignitaries that did Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam has undertaken any journey by water? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. No, I never knew in the Sunnah that the Prophet took a journey by water. Uh, even most of the Sahaba were not known to have uh, taken journeys on water. Uh, it came later with the Muslims when they started to conquer new lands. They traveled on boats and they made a Muslim navy, if you want to say, to defend the Muslim men and to conquer other lands at that time. I don't know anything from the Sunnah where the Prophet ﷺ actually took a journey uh, by water. Allah so it is not clear whether Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has undertaken journey yeah. by water. This is, what, this is what I know that he has. Okay, thank you, sir. The next question from the front mic. Uh, my name is Muhammad Nizamuddin. I'm an SAP professional. And my question is like, as per Quran and Sunnah, what is the legal verdict regarding tobacco consumption? Is it haram or makruh? And uh, like in Surah Al-Baqarah, I've, I've uh, seen the translation as like, uh, if you take anything which is uh, toxic to you, it is haram to you. Please, just a reminder, everybody, I'm serious when I say it. the questions must be on topic. You can easily visit a fatwa website for this. Again, I'll leave it to the speaker if he wishes to address this, but keep the questions on the topic. First of all, before I say if it's makruh or haram, I want to explain why at, at one time there was a difference of opinion. Why some scholars used to say it was makruh and some would say it was haram. That's because when cigarettes, back when they first came to the Muslim nations, there's no ayah, hadith that says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, don't smoke. Don't chew tobacco. So the scholars looked at similarities. They found that whoever smokes, he smells bad. He has smoker's breath. And they looked at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he forbid them from 
going to the masjid if they have eaten the basl, onions, or garlic. Thum. And they said just as these people, they, have, they stink or they have bad breath, also the smoker is the same. So he said, and then it's makru. However, other scholars at the beginning, they looked at it and they said it's haram from the beginning. Later, all of the scholars, I don't really know anybody now who says it's makru. And he's somebody who is a real scholar and understands Islam properly, who would say that it's makru. A lot of the general people of the Muslim ummah, they know the old fatwa of makru and they still want to hold on to it. So they can say they're not doing that, which is haram. But after the scholars learn, for example, in Egypt and Al-Azhar and these places, when they learn that uh, smoking causes cancer, it kills you, uh, it's a waste of money, uh, all the evil effects that smoking has, now all of the ma major uh, places of fatwa throughout the, the Islamic world, they say it's haram. Because of the, the evil effects that it has, it wastes your money, it, uh, it harms your health, and it could eventually kill you. And it, killing yourself is one of the great sins in Islam, and it's not allowed. And Allahu alam. The next question from the Ramai. With due respect to you, sir. Okay. With so much faith in Islam and people believing, or uh, forget about those who don't believe or don't read. You talk about so much negativity. You remember death. Before dying, people die hundreds and millions of times. Why is Islam portraying so much negativity? And what about the conflict? Those people who are on the right path. Suppose if some people misguide them, what is the direction to today's youngsters? There is so much. You talk about disasters. Disasters were also from ages. Today, some, something is not new. Uh, bomb attacks are not new. Volcanoes are not new. Earthquakes are not new. If something is to be destructive, why should we remember death every moment? Why cannot we re remember life? If I have a brother on my left and my right, why can't I? It's, uh, there's a sprit. There's a sprit moving. Why can't I uh, uh, infuse life in them? Why do I make them scared or feared? Death, death, death. Inshallah, ek din marna hai. Everybody has to die. You, me, every, all the kings, all the princes. Who? Yeah, perfect. My, it's, my it's question, clear. It's, it's my, clear what you want to say. I, I got sir, you. Sir, uh, you didn't get me. Just the last. Why are not people positive about life, inducing life? Why death? Uh, when we talk about death, the importance of remembering death, as I mentioned, it so we can be prepared and meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the best states. Because if you're not prepared, that means you're not going to try to ha have as many good deeds as you can. It means that you can meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're doing something that's displeasing to Him. That's what I'm talking about death. But also, when we're living our life in this dunya, we also have to make life to the fullest. We have to try to find the halawa of iman, the beauty of life and, the, and, and our search for happiness. That we, found this, we find the sweetness of iman and this is what helps us get through this, this life. And we must make our life to the fullest. We don't, um, I'm not saying now, we will say, we, let's talk about death, that we go home, we sit back and just think about death and we have only fear. No, we also have hope and we also enjoy life. We, we try to build in this dunya and be as productive as we can to, to our societies. So we have, we have to have a full life at the same time. We have to realize what I'm trying to say is that some, uh, or any, and this is what I'm talking about disasters, when you see such a large amount of death at one time, this reminds you of the reality of death and that's where all of us are going. This doesn't mean that we're not going to live a full life. We're not going to strive to be uh, engineers or doctors or whatever it is we do in life. No, we must strive. We must try to uh, build houses if we can build a house for our children and for this and do as much as we can and benefit from this dunya and to have a happy life. But also, we cannot forget the reality of death that it's coming, maybe quicker than a lot of us know. So we must be prepared for what is coming, and Allahu Alam. Thank you very much. The next question from the sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Fahana, I am a student. In your speech, you quote the verse of Surah Rum, Zahar al Fasad fil Bar. Could you please explain this verse again? Now in this verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the evil has become an apparent or clear on land and at sea. And this evil, as I said, I believe I did explain it during the talk, was that it could be any type of evil. It could be corruption. In a lot of societies today, they have corruption. And it's corrupt societies. It could be this type of corruption. It could be other types of evil. Uh, it could be crime. It could be the evil we see from disasters and tragedies. Where does this come from? Bima kasabat aid dinas. What the people have earned with their own hands, what they have done, 
And because when you, when you know when you are committing sins, you're doing that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what causes these types of disasters. So after this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentions that it's, it's so they can taste. So they, they can taste that what they have done. Because they have done that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is punishing them for what they have done to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and not following His way and following His law. And then it's a reminder for him that perhaps they will return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When they see this, these great tragedies and evil, they know that the only way out is to have their hearts attached to Allah 